from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Privilege to work at the Washington Post for 22 years. So I'm happy to underscore the fact that the paper is a proud charter sponsor of this festival. I wish I could introduce the authors of a dozen books about food today because I love what you get out of them. I'm here to introduce Professor Jessica B. Harris, who, as you can see from your program, has written 11 books and has contributed so much to our understanding of African culinary history. Those traditions have literally changed the world. Her most recent book is High on the Hog, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. She's going to be signing those books, by the way, from 4 to 5 at Tent 6, which is just a little bit past this, past uh, Pavilion A, by the way. I could recap her accomplishments in detail, which include several degrees, 30 years of research and writing and traveling and speaking, her work to establish an institute for the study of culinary cultures at Dillard University in New Orleans, her consultant gigs for international food organizations, her memberships on food-related boards, and her awards, which include her induction last year into the James Beard Foundation's Who's Who in Food and Beverage in America. But I'd rather talk about her food. No surprise there. I feel like I know her a little because I make her chicken yassa. Has anybody made that? There you go. It's a dish that or originated in Senegal. She first tasted it, she told me, in 1972 in West Africa. Variations of it have cropped up in a few of her books and may keep doing so because it happens to be one of her favorites. And I can see why. It doesn't call for many ingredients, and they are humble ones at that. Take a whole cut up chicken, and you marinate it in a jumble of lemon juice and onions, habanero pepper and salt and pepper and peanut oil. You broil that marinated chicken so its skin is crisp and browned. Your kitchen already starts filling with aromas that will permeate the neighborhood. You saute the onions used in the marinade because you're not wasting anything. And then you put it in a big pot. You add broiled the broiled chicken pieces, plus pimento stuffed olives and carrots and mustard and another whole habanero. In less than a half an hour, it's like magic happens. The chicken is tender and velvety, and it barely hangs on to the bone. The sauce has heat and depth, and whoever's in the house comes into the kitchen. I know this. And then when you spoon that saucy, savory, piquant, colorful heap onto a bed of hot white rice, the world is a happy place. It's fitting that Jessica lives in New York City and New Orleans and Martha's Vineyard as well, because those are all great places to eat. I read somewhere that she has place settings for 50 people ready at all times. And that, on top of everything else, makes her a hero for me. So ladies and gentlemen, Jessica B. Harris. Wow. <laughs> Who is that lady? I'd love to meet her. First of all, thank you for remaining. Hopefully, I will be worth the remains. Uh, but also, thanks to the Library of Congress, thanks to you, Bonnie, for that wonderful, fulsome introduction. Now I have to live up to it. Uh, chicken yassa. One of the reasons that yassa is my kind of touchstone dish, if you will, is because it was a key for me. In And uh, listening to that introduction, I'm always struck by the fact that I'm old. <laughs> it's like, oh Lord, you've done a lot of stuff. No wonder you're tired. So I'm working at trying to figure it all through. But the yasa goes back actually to probably my first trip to West Africa, which was BR, before Roots. And going to West Africa, BR, was a very different experience from going to West Africa AR, after roots. Um, I went with my mother, who was my best bud and traveling companion for a long time. And 
We had an interesting trip. Uh, we started out in Senegal. Senegal being, okay, you get to see it. <clears throat> this is my shtick, the handy dandy map of Africa. Sorry. Senegal, <laughs> South Africa, the cellulite zone would be um, Ivory Coast and you know, all of that stuff coming down here. <laughs> Angola. So, Senegal. The westernmost point in Africa. Senegal is fascinating because it has been a linchpin, if you will, of what is called the African Atlantic world nowadays, or um, you know, sort of of the African diaspora. It is interesting because it was also a part of Western Africa that was earliest on in touch with Europe. So it is a point of fusion. It is a point of gathering. It is a point of coming together. It also is a place that houses the rather infamous House of the Slaves on Gore Island, so it was equally a point of departure. But the thing that's interesting about Senegal is it's where some of the tastes come together. In Yasa, you find the chicken, you find the onions, you find what chefs nowadays like to talk about infusing flavor into food. Well, I always thought food had flavor, but infusing flavor is kind of like making it pop even more. If you think of the recipe as Bonnie gave it to you, it marinates in fusion one. Then it grills, it gets smoky in that, you know, the thing that we get when we get barbecued meat and barbecued chicken. And you know, my mother used to say no pink chicken. Pink chicken should not be pink. Chicken should be thoroughly cooked. So it gets cooked, and then you stew it. So you've got infusion one, infusion two, infusion three. Obviously, what comes out is very, very flavorful. And so all of those things are part of the tastes, and in some cases, the techniques that took that journey from Gore Island to this hemisphere. Uh, it's interesting for me to be in D.C. I'm from New York. I'm a native New Yorker, born and raised up there. But I remember that as a child in D.C., my parents used to always tell me that D.C. was kind of, again, one of those pivot points. It was a linchpin. It's a linchpin between the South and the North. And they used to remind me that back in the day, and I'm old enough to remember the day, although I was not old enough to have this experience, uh, on the trains, as folks came north from the south during the great migrations, the Pullman car porters, who were black, would go through the Jim Crow cars of the train and call out this ironic rhyme. Coming into DC, coming into DC, time to put on your powder and paint and make folks think you is what you ain't. <laughs> so this city has long fascinated me. And as I drove around with some friends last night, I saw you know, the Palladian buildings, the wide prospects. It's, it's a city that reeks power. Um, I've been to Delhi in India. And when you go to Rajpat, you get this sort of imperial architecture. And the thing that's interesting is here, the city was built by black people. We were enslaved, and they processed, cooked, and served many of the meals in this city, and still do up until very recently, and probably still can make a good case for it today. It is of them that I really want to speak this afternoon, and I want to take you with me on a journey over time and space. It's a journey that begins in enslavement, traverses hell to undergo a sea change, endures trials and tribulations, and ends in hallelujah. Now, it is a journey of a people, my people in our culture, but it's not the culture that's usually spoken of. It's not music. We're all kind of familiar with the African contributions to that, or dance. We can probably understand the rootedness to the earth and the dancing that way, uh, or gesture, or even language. It's a journey of our culinary culture. Now. In case you hadn't already figured this out, I should warn you, I can talk forever. I am a college teacher. I've done that for mm, years. And uh, my grandfather was a Baptist minister, so square that. 
Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is, if I say something you don't understand, feel free to hop up and say, excuse me. But equally, um, understand that I talk in professorial parentheses. Hopefully, this circuitous journey will end at a spot where all the parentheses are closed. But if I start off on a tangent, feel free to draw me back. And I'm going to talk until, I'm going to give you about 15 minutes for questions at the end. So hopefully, you will meet some people over this journey. Some of them will have names. All too many of them are nameless. Nameless folks who toiled and died and were forgotten by all but their kin. Hopefully today we will recall them to life with the soothing salve of words. It began on the African continent. And much of what we know today about the capture and enslavement of Africans comes from sources from the 19th century. We can read the slave narratives, things of that sort. One of the earliest sources we have is from a man who billed himself simply as an Ebo from Esaka. And I'm reading from my latest book, which is called High on the Hog, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America. <coughs> Hanging on the walls of the Royal Albert Museum in Exeter, England, is an 18th century portrait of a black man. The man is dressed in the clothing of the period, a scarlet waistcoat and an immaculate white stock, simply tied. He gazes at the observer from the canvas with a slight smile at the corners of his full mouth. The smile, though, does not reach his eyes, which are filled with sadness. The portrait, attributed to a member of the English school, is titled Portrait of a Negro Man, Olauda Equiano. Olauda Equiano, also known as Gustavus Vassa, was the individual who offered the earliest and most detailed account of his capture, enslavement, and journey to America in the Middle Passage. While many slave narratives detail the lives of the enslaved in the 19th century, few portrayed the 18th century, and even fewer still detailed the horrors of capture and the de degradation of the Middle Passage. Much of what the world knows about the early period of the slave trade comes from this autobiography, which was entitled The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olauda Equiano, or Gustavus Vassa, the African, written by himself. Born in Igbo in what would become Nigeria, Equiano led an extraordinary life. Captured as a child, he was sold to various African masters and eventually found himself in the hands of white slave traders who shipped him to the colonies. And there was a lot of that, um, the shipping to the colonies and remember that we're talking now about the 18th century, so prior to American independence, there were the northern colonies and the Caribbean colonies, and certainly a trade between the colonies. So um, he was taken to Barbados, and then eventually sold in Virginia to Michael Pascal. His master was a naval captain, and as Pascal's personal servant, Equiano accompanied him and traveled to Europe with his master, he saw action in the Seven Years' War and was given rudimentary naval training. He also performed a variety of military duties aboard ship. During the journeys with his master, which took him as far afield as the Mediterranean and Canada, very different view of enslavement from the one we usually get, isn't it? Okay, he received an education and learned to read and write. At the end of the war, however, Equiano did not reap the benefits that had been promised, prize money and freedom. Instead, he was sold again, this time in the Caribbean where travels had taken him. His education made him too valuable, way too valuable for plantation labor, and potential buyers were understandably leery of acquiring a slave who could not only read and write, but knew how to navigate a ship. I think I'd have thought about that too. He was eventually sold to Robert King, a Quaker merchant from Philadelphia, who allowed Equiano to engage in his own trading activities and promised that he would free him upon the payment of 40 pounds. By the time he was in his 20s, Equiano had earned enough money through his trading to pay the debt and was a free man. As unscrupulous traders had attempted to re-enslave him during his Philadelphia sojourn, Equiano fully understood the perils of being free and black in federal America 
and he declined King's offer to remain there and become his business partner. Rather, he journeyed to England where he spent the rest of his life as a public figure. In 1789, three months before the storming of the Bastille, and 1789 is a date we're going to hear about a lot, even though we're talking American history, not French history, Equiano published, self-published his autobiography. The book was a runaway bestseller in London and directly influenced British attitudes towards slavery and fueled the abolitionist cause. Equiano promoted the book assiduously through speeches. He became renowned and wealthy, and when he died eight years after the book's publication, he left a considerable estate. He was known to the Prince of Wales, not this one, that one, okay, and numerous dukes as well, and by, of course, all of the leading abolitionist statements of the time. Equiano, though, when he sat down to recall his life, remembered not only the travails of the Middle Passage, the brutalities of enslavement, and the multiple events of his peripatetic life, he also remembered the tastes of Africa. And he recalled the foods eaten in his West African village. And I quote from Equiano. Our manner of living is entirely plain, for as yet the natives are unacquainted with those refinements of cookers which debauch the taste. Bullocks, goats, and poultry supply the greatest part of their food. These constitute likewise the principal wealth of the country and the chief articles of its commerce. The flesh is usually stewed in a pan. To make it savory, we sometimes also use pepper and other spices. And we have salt made from wood ashes. Our vegetables are mostly plantains, eddas, and those of you from the Caribbean would know them as eddos, yams, and here we're talking about true yams, not sweet potatoes. Different thing botanically. I might get back to that if there's time and Indian corn. And this is certainly an indication that this happened after what we foodies call the Columbian Exchange. You know that corn is from the New World, and it didn't exist anywhere in the Old World until Columbus. So when we talk about the Columbian Exchange, we're talking about the ebb and flow of foodstuffs from this hemisphere to the world. So pre-Columbian Exchange, no tomatoes in Italy, no chilies in Thailand, okay? No potatoes in Ireland. No pigs over here. Post-Columbian exchange, all of that starts to move. So it had begun to move, and obviously Equiano was familiar with the corn. He also talks about beverages, and he says, they are totally unacquainted with strong or spirituous liquors. And their principal beverage is palm wine. This is gotten from a tree of that name by tapping it at the top and fastening a large gourd to it. And sometimes one tree will yield four or five gallons in a night. When just drawn, it is of a most delicious sweetness. But in a few days, it acquires a tartish and more spirituous flavor. And I, who have sampled palm wine, can tell you, and the kick of a country mule. Several scholars today actually question whether or not Equiano was as he advertised himself, an Ebo from Esaka. It has been argued that his autobiography is a composite one made up of the reminiscences of a number of enslaved, or even that it is a work of pure imagination. No matter what the final verdict, the interesting narrative of the life of Olauda Equiano remains a moving account of the trade that ripped millions from their homeland transported them to another hemisphere for more than five centuries. Equiano speaks for the millions of individuals who departed captives and arrived enslaved with no families, no friends, no possessions, nothing except the fading memories of their distant homeland and perhaps, like Equiano, a fleeting memory of the sweetness of palm wine on their tongues. But Equiano is not the only one, and the book actually goes through a series of things. I neglected to tell you, and this is one of those parentheses again, that the book is, each chapter is divided into three parts. The first part is sort of what the French would call a mise en scène, a setting of a stage. It's usually a personal narrative that talks about some place, a compass point on the journey. The middle section of each chapter is the history, the meat, if you will. And then uh, those of you from Louisiana would understand the word lanyap, a little something extra. Each chapter ends with a lanyap. And so that piece about Equiano 
was the lanyard for chapter two, which is called Sea Change. But now, since we're in DC, I want to talk about um, two people who attained the highest honors of the culinary profession at an early period and who were chefs to the founding fathers. In the 21st century, it is difficult to conceive that at the time of the First Continental Congress, all the 13 colonies were slaveholding. Indeed, no signer of the Declaration of Independence was without the taint of slavery. Even if the individual was not a slaveholder himself, all the districts represented by the signers were slaveholding. It was the norm, therefore, that the father of the country, George Washington, was a slaveholder, not the exception. His plantation, Mount Vernon, comprised 8,000 acres and was divided into five separate farms on which the enslaved worked. At Mount Vernon, and later in New York and in Philadelphia, Washington's kitchen was manned by enslaved blacks, overseen by a slave, big house cook. At Mount Vernon, this person was named Hercules. And every time I say Hercules, I always think of that Eddie Murphy movie with Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> as that whole conceit of giving enslaved Africans Greek names and Roman names and such is a little, hmm, okay. Anyhow, described as a celebrated artiste and an accomplished master of the culinary arts by his contemporaries, Hercules had begun his life at the kitchen in Mount Vernon, probably as a member of a house servant's family. Little is known about him, but I would imagine that, like many young boys who worked around the big house kitchens in the South, he was no doubt first tasked with hauling water and bringing in logs, removing ashes and other menial jobs. And then he worked his way up the pecking order. It is known that he was named chief cook at Mount Vernon by 1786. He was brought to New York when his master was displeased with the presidential fair there. And when the capital moved to Philadelphia, Hercules moved there as well. He won accolades and was noted for his exacting efficiency and the flawless working of his kitchen at 190 High Street. And if you've been to Philadelphia recently, there is a whole new exhibit of the President's House where you can see the remains of this kitchen. Um, this is a story that's way more complex. I sort of simplified it rather cruelly for the purposes of the book. But there were all sorts of laws that you know, sort of governed how long would one, a slave could stay in Philadelphia without self-manumitting or declaring freedom. And Washington very clearly knew these laws, and so Hercules was shipped back to Mount Vernon periodically so that he didn't overstay his time. Anyhow, he was an incredible manager, apparently, and he was known for his exacting efficiency and that flawless kitchen. Uh, Martha Washington's grandson, George Washington Park Custis, called him, and I quote, as highly accomplished and as proficient in the culinary art as could be found in the United States. That's pretty high praise. Another observer was even more eloquent, and I quote again, iron discipline. Woe to his underlings if speck or spot could be discovered on the table, or if the utensils did not shine like polished silver. His underlings flew in all directions to execute his orders while he, the great master spirit, seemed to possess the power of ubiquity and to be everywhere at the same time. Shades of master chef. Hercules' duties extended beyond simply cooking. He also oversaw the smooth running of Washington's kitchens, which at one point contained a German cook and two French ones. He managed their work. Unfortunately, no recipes have uh, sort of survived that were attributed to Hercules, but he must have been adept at preparing the steak and kidney pie and the trifle that were known to be among Washington's favorite dishes. He oversaw not only all of the family meals, but also the more formal Thursday dinners and congressional repasts that were served up to the founding fathers with style and aplomb on top white linen and accompanied by glittering crystal, fine porcelain, and highly polished silver. Respected by his peers, feared by his underlings, and renowned in Philadelphia as the presidential chef. Hercules was also known as a dandy, and this is one of those sort of 
things that you find out as you research that sort of make you smile. He, um, like many of the chefs of that period, was able to sell leftover food and tallow. Now, tallow was very important because it was used in candle making. And since the illumination was from candles, anybody that could sell tallow made a fair amount of money. So his perquisites from the kitchen garnered him a tidy sum of almost $200 a year, which was a fair amount of money. Following the presidential meals, he would step out onto the streets of Philadelphia. He was a dandy, immaculately attired, linen, silk shorts, a waistcoat, and I believe that the waistcoat was blue, a velvet collared frock coat, silver buckle shoes, a cock hat, and a gold handled cane to head forth to meet with the other fashionable black dandies of the city. The city was obviously full of them, not obviously, but Philadelphia was one of those gathering points. It was a point where a lot of free Africans, free people of color came together. And so there were many taverns where they would meet. But despite his princely income, his fame, and his relative freedom of movement, Hercules was not content with his lot. He wanted his freedom. He yearned for it and planned for it and escaped when he could. Tobias Lear, Washington's longtime personal secretary, recorded his escape and said, I quote from Lear, it is sad to relate that Uncle Harkless, as Hercules was known by the family, was so captivated with the delights of Philadelphia that in 1797, on the day Washington left the city to retire to private life at the end of his second term, he ran away rather than return to Mount Vernon. Although diligent inquiries were made for him, he was never apprehended. Now, this is obviously one example. I mean, and Washington did not give up Hercules lightly, gladly, or willingly. He sent people out to look for him. He offered rewards for him. He, um, you know, did his diligence. However, he had slipped off into the night. His six-year-old daughter, Hercules' six-year-old daughter, who remained enslaved at Mount Vernon, it isn't that he didn't leave a family behind, expressed thoughts that were probably more representative of those of Uncle Harkless himself. When asked by a guest at Mount Vernon if she were upset never to see her father again, she replied, oh sir, I am very glad because he is free now, a six-year-old. So despite our lack of knowledge of him or his dishes, Hercules, the chef who doesn't even have a last name for history, was more than just a grace note to the history of African-American chefs. He was, in fact, the first black chef for the country's first chief executive. Uh, but he wasn't the only one. The first chief executive may have set the bar with his black chef, but the preeminent Beckfin of the founding fathers was undeniably Thomas Jefferson. The man from Monticello and his culinary contributions to the American menu are legion. Less well known, perhaps, is the fact that Jefferson was also responsible for the inclusion of many African foodstuffs in the diet of Virginians. He brought sesame which is actually native to the African continent. That was one of those things that was mind-boggling to me. I thought, oh, must be Asian. He brought okra. He brought black-eyed peas. So all of those things came in through Jefferson. Furthermore, he promoted African-American chefs and cooks to the highest level of their profession. And one of these gentlemen was a man named James Hemings. The name Hemings is familiar because you know of Sally Hemings. Yet little is known about Sally's brother, who was also one of the slaves on the farm that made up Jefferson's estates. Hemings excelled in the culinary room world and was singled out for his industry and his talent. And again, in the 1780s, that crucial period. In 1784, at Jefferson's request, he set sail from Boston Harbor to Paris. He arrived in Paris to be Jefferson's chef in Paris and apprentice to French chefs while Jefferson was the ambassadeur plenipotentiaire from the United States to the court of Louis XVI. 
Now, the thing that was interesting about this is that the Paris that Jefferson arrives in is a city in transition. Again, think about those dates. 1784, we are five years before the storming of the Bastille. It's a crucial time to be in Paris. It's a crucial time to be in Paris for any number of reasons, not just the revolutionary fervor, but the other thing that's going on is as the world was democratizing, food was also democratizing. In fact, the word restaurant was created by law in 1782. So se restaurer, to restore oneself, led to these spots where people went to restore themselves that were not taverns, that were not coffee houses, but that became restaurants. And so these counterbalance the formality. If you've seen that, um, I think it's Sofia Coppola, the Marie Antoinette film, that service uh, a la Francaise, that service of the king where everyone is sort of rigid and you know, you have to ask the first footman to tell the second footman to tell the third footman to ask somebody to pour you a glass of water that then has to pass back that same way. So this was all going out of the window, pretty much the same time that the king was getting ready to lose his head. But what happened is Hemings is there in the midst of all of that. He is learning. He has been apprenticed to French chefs. And in fact, he's apprenticed to the highest of the high as far as French chefs go. He is apprenticed to a maître combo, but he moves up the ranks until he finally ends up cooking for the king's cousin, the Comte de Condé. And the princes of Condé were princes of the blood. But what happens at that is ultimately in counterpoint, if you will, to Hercules in Washington, Jefferson and Hemings, Jefferson could, Hemings could have self manumitted when he was in Paris, but he doesn't. And it's one of the things that we are all curious about. Why doesn't he declare his freedom? Uh, it's been sort of suggested that perhaps he saw what was going on with his sister and he said, let me stick around and see what's going to happen with that. But whatever happens, he returns. And he comes back to the United States where he equally chafes under enslavement. Now remember, Hercules and Hemings are in Philadelphia at the same time. I've always wondered what that conversation might have been. Because unlike Hercules, Hemings petitions Jefferson. And in 1793, he asks Jefferson for his freedom. And Jefferson grants the request, grudgingly, and says the following, writes the following. I quote from Jefferson, having been at great expense in having James Hemings taught the art of cookery, desiring to befriend him and to require from him as little as possible, I do hereby promise and declare that if the said James shall go with me to Monticello in the course of the ensuing winter when I go to reside there myself, and shall there continue until he shall have taught such person as I shall place under him for the purpose to be a good cook, this previous condition being performed, he shall thereupon be made free, and I will thereupon execute the proper instruments to make him free, given under my hand and seal in the county of Philadelphia in the state of Pennsylvania, this 15th day of September, 1793. Well, interestingly, that letter has absolutely no legal bearing, but what happens is Jefferson does stand by it. Hemings does return to Monticello. Jefferson does free him. Uh, the person that Hemings teaches to cook is actually another Hemings relative, and so the tradition continues in that family. But on February 26, 1796, Hemings leaves for Philadelphia with $30 from Jefferson to, quote, bear his expenses. He was free. He was also restless. He apparently, and we're still, you know, I mean, the thing that's so fun about food history and particularly about African-American food history is it's all sort of under there. It's sort of subcutaneous. It's about reading between the lines and intuiting the unsaid in some cases. But in this case, we don't know. We know that he lived in Philadelphia. We think that he may have traveled to Spain. He finally settled in Baltimore. Now, 
When Jefferson contacts him again, he's been elected third president. And he chooses Hemings for his chef. And he sends word to Hemings, please, I want you to come. I want you to be my chef. However, Hemings had a sense of himself, a very real sense of himself. And Jefferson only speaks to Hemings through an intermediary. And Hemings says, you know, he probably did what a lot of folks have done in years since and hummed five verses of come by here. He wanted Jefferson to ask him directly, don't send me an intermediary, talk to me. Jefferson, for some reason, couldn't. And so Hemings refuses. Hemings refuses. It never happens. He declines the post because he does not get what he has requested, thereby depriving the country of its first official black White House chef. The job went instead to a Frenchman, Henri Julien, but slaves from Monticello worked under him and still tended the pots in the kitchen of America's first house. Later, though, in 1801, Hemings did return to Monticello and was hired as chef, but he never assumed the post. That fall, word reached the plantation on the hill that Hemings had taken his own life. Obviously, he was a troubled man. But that distinction between Hemings and Hercules is an interesting counterpoint to the tales of enslavement. And I'm getting signs waved at me, so I'm going to jump rather cruelly to, ah, oh goodness. Well, this one I've got to read because I think, no, nah, I'll read, I'll jump, I'll jump. Otherwise, I'll talk too long. That's that Baptist minister thing going there. I'm going to end with this, and it's the final coda, the last lanyap of the book, if you will. And it's called A Final Definition. African Americans have had a long love affair with food, one perhaps unequaled in the history of the country. For centuries, we've brought the Pequot tastes of Africa to the New World. With particular relish, we yam, grease, and grit, whether it's a bologna sandwich and a peanut patty tucked into the bib of overalls for a working man's snack, or a late night supper of chitlins and champagne eaten off fine bone china. Some of us delight in a sip of white lightning from a mason jar in a juke joint, while others delicately lift little fingers and savor minted iced tea or a cool drink while fanning and watching the neighbors on the front porch. Good times are bad. Food provides a time for communion and relaxation. It's so much a part of our lives that it seems at times as though a supreme being created us from a favorite recipe. There was a heaping cup full of cornmeal to signal our links with the Native Americans, a rounded teaspoon of biscuit dough for southern gentility, a mess of greens and a dozen okra pods for our African roots and a good measure of molasses to recall the tribulations of slavery. A seasoning piece of fat back signals our last in love for the almighty pig, and a smoked turkey wing foretells our healthier future. <clears throat> a handful of hot chilies gives the mixture attitude and sass, while a hearty dose of bourbon mellows it out, and a splash of corn liquor gives it a kick. There are regional additions, such as a bit of Benny from South Carolina, a hint of praline from New Orleans, and a drop of at least 12 types of barbecue sauce, a fried porgy, a drop of at least, I'm sorry, a fried porgy, a splash of homemade scoopernog wine, and a heaping portion of that secret ingredient called love fill the bowl to overflowing. When well mixed, it can be either baked, broiled, roasted, fried, sauteed, or barbecued, and the result has yielded us in all hues of the rainbow from lightly toasted to deep well done. With a start like that, it's not surprising then that we have had our own way with food for generations. We have called it our way and incorporated our wondrous way with food and eating into our daily lives. We have rocked generations of babies to sleep while crooning shortening bread. Laugh to the comedy of pig meat Markham and butter beans and Susie. Dance the cakewalk and tapped our feet to the music of Jelly Roll Morton or gotten hot and sweaty over salsa or just sat down with friends and chewed the fat. 
We've had the blues over the kitchen man, searched for our sugar pie honey bunch, called our sugar candy, and longed to be loved like lilac wine. And when we found it, we celebrated with a pig foot and a bottle of beer, or just kicked back and hollered past the couvoisier. In short, we've created our own culinary universe, one where an ample grandmother presides over the kitchen, where the pungent aroma of greens mixes with the molasses perfume of pralines and the bubbling from a big iron gumbo pot punctuates her soft humming. This is the universe where Aunt Jemima takes off her kerchief and sits down at the table, where Uncle Ben blows his head and blesses the food. The Louisiana coffee woman passes the plates and Rastus, the cream of wheat man, tells tall tales over a taste of whiskey to the banana man. It's the warmth of the kitchen, tempered by the formality of the dining room, and the love of family that extends over generations and across bloodlines. And with the improvisational genius that gave the world jazz and salsa, as well as rumba, rap, and reggae, we have cooked our way into the hearts, minds, and stomachs of a country. Thank you. And I guess this is the point at which I'm supposed to ask, are there any questions? I, I have a question. question. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, it's interesting because actually Isabel Wilkerson, Wilkerson is going to be speaking soon in The Warmth of Other Suns, and her book is all about the great migration from south to north between 1915 and 1975. And I guess my question for you is whether in your book you trace more of how the culinary art of African-American cuisine sort of changed as as there was migration into different communities in North. Absolutely, and let me tell you, uh, well, just this little nugget of information. Uh, a friend of mine, a gentleman named Alexander Smalls, once had a cafe in New York called the Shoebox Cafe. Now, African Americans of a certain age and generation know all about the shoebox. It's part of what went north. You had a shoebox. In the shoebox, you had fried chicken, deviled eggs, maybe a cupcake or a slice of pound cake. I'm seeing people in the front row going, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, an orange. And the shoebox was because you did not know when or where you might be able to stop on the road. And so the shoebox traveled with you. I remember eons ago I was doing, or was asked to do a television show, something for the History Channel, they were talking about fried chicken. I took a shoebox in, but I made sure there were Jimmy Choo's just so we could sort of signify on that shoebox a little bit. Okay. But yes, and, and the food changes. The food changes, the food morphs. Southern food comes north. Southern food goes west. The great Creole diaspora from southern Louisiana to Oklahoma to Los Angeles. You can get some, some of the best Creole food in the country in Los Angeles, but all of those routes, all of those train terminuses, food was going all of those places. Yes. Um, this side. Yes. Hi, Ms. Harris. I was wondering if you could comment on the title of the book. High oh, on the, hog. the title of the book, High on the Hog. Okay, well, hi, the title on the book is interesting because it comes from Massa and John Humor. Massa and John Humor is the humor that evolved out of the sort of self deprecating humor of the plantations. John is the trickster. John always gets over on Massa. And this is one of those stories that you can string out into a long shaggy dog story or you can abbreviate, so I'm gonna abbreviate it somewhat. But essentially, Massa killed 40 or 50 hogs every year and he would always go to John because John was the one who was expert at that and he'd go down to the quarters and he'd knock on John's cabin door and say, John, it's hog killing time tomorrow. I need you to be back, back 40. Uh, we're gonna kill about five or six hogs and you know, you can have the head, the tail, the feet, and a bucket of guts. That would be the chitlins. Uh, and John would go down there and he would do as he was asked and do all of those things and receive his pay. And that went on for years and years and years until John one day got his own hog. And then he got another hog. And then one day old Massa came and knocked on John's cabin door and John came to the door and said, yes, so. Master said, be down at the house early in the morning. I want to kill hogs. 
be there about 5.30. And John sort of rears back and says, well, what you paying? I'll pay you like I always did. I'll give you the head and all the ears and the feet and the tails and a bucket of guts. And John says, well, Massa, I don't rightly think so. I can't, because I'm eating higher on the hog than that now. I got three hogs of my own, and I'm eating spare rib and backbone and pork chops and middling and everything else. I eat high on the hog now. Now, you got to watch this. wondering if you could talk a little bit about your writing process as far as selecting a topic and I'm sorry it, about your writing process oh. uh <laughs> would that I had one I um my training and background are in French and theater so of course I teach English and write cookbooks um I um I'm curious, and I think I started out as a, a writer, basically doing book reviews. And then I went from book reviews to features, and from features to travel, because I've always traveled, and my primary education was at the United Nations International School, so I've always had a sort of international approach to life. Uh, I got to be the first non-UN related kid to go there, so I say I went with you know, Ralph Bunch's kids and all of that kind of stuff. So it was kind of an interesting time to be there, sort of say to people, oh yeah, I'm a black girl from Queens, but my oldest friend in the world is a Shivite Brahmin from Madras, India. And they look at you like, ah. So, um, so my methodology really came through the travel writing in a way, which is, I like to think I speak international hand drive. And so I'd be in a market and I'd be pointing at the pot and going, hmm, you know, what's in it? And you know, if it wasn't in French, Spanish, or Portuguese, or English, I um, couldn't know, couldn't understand the answer, but I kind of got it. And so that started the cookbooks. And um, then as I started to write about food, and as I wrote my first book, which well, came out in God knows what year, but um, I realized that the methodology was more about history. Uh, the first book was called Hot Stuff and it was about food made with peppers and chilies from around the world and I read Columbus's diaries and I read Marco Polo's travel accounts and so it wasn't about recipe, it was really more about history and things of that sort and I think all of that came together in the other books because basically the second book was called Iron Pots and Wooden Spoons, Africa's Gifts to New World Cooking and then the subsequent books have all been just sort of stops on the trail, if you will. This one is different. And this one is the, um, the result of the fact that the head notes for each recipe were just getting longer and longer and longer because there were stories to tell. And so this is some of the stories. But that's about much methodology as I've got. Thanks. Yes. Uh, thank you. I'm interested in the difference between yams and sweet potatoes. Oh, OK. Good. <laughs> Um, different, totally different botanically. Uh, different genus, different species. Unless you've shopped in a Hispanic or a Caribbean or uh, an African market, you've probably never seen a yam. They are tubers. They are more fibrous on the outside. They can be brown fleshed on the outside, or brown skinned on the outside, but the flesh inside can be any color from pristine white to slightly purple tinged. And the taste is very much more like a white or Irish potato than like a sweet potato. And, you know, I, they'll drum me out of the state, but I've probably said worse things. There's no such thing as a Louisiana yam, it's a Louisiana sweet potato. Okay, so at uh, Thanksgiving you're having candied sweet potatoes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hello. I've just discovered the uh, Food Network, and, um, and and what's so fascinating about the Food Network is that my wife comes in sometimes and she says, "You do spend more time watching the Food Network than cooking." My question is about the book and the. And the cookbook itself. K 
can it help America change the way we eat? Can it help us understand that how we eat now, the history that got us here, cannot be the same way that gets us the next 50 years and still be able to mm -hmm. thrive? How do we use the book to change the way in which we live? Okay, that's uh, an interesting question. I'm getting the overtime sign. Uh, short answer so that everybody can hear it is, sometimes you gotta know where you've been so you can understand where you're going. Uh, but that would be Janice, that would be Sankofa, that would be all of those things. But along with that, I think that the fact that we are increasingly interested in food bodes well for us. Uh, if you think of the traditional African-American diet, post-enslavement, because we didn't have any choice about it during enslavement, we were rural people for the most part. That would be the Wilkinson book is the whole urban migration from rural. As rural people, yeah, we ate pig, but we knew its name, and we knew what went into the pig, and we knew what it had, had probably for breakfast, lunch, and dinner until we had it. We had our own greens, or we traded and foraged with neighbors. Uh, this return to the land is something that we did. We grew the food. Uh, when you talk about the slaves on many of these plantations, they were provisioning the plantations as well as growing whatever the cash crop was. So our skills are there. We just need to reactivate them. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.